it. We're so glad that you're here this morning, and we want to welcome you to Magnolia Church. It is really good to see students here. We probably had about 70, 75 students in the first service. Uh, this is Welcome Weekend at CBU, and so many of the programming is already starting today. But let's welcome all of our students that are in this service. We're grateful that you're here. We want to... We want to invite you to our student ministries. It meets at 7 o'clock on Sunday nights and uh, meets in the C building up on the second floor called The Loft, and we're grateful that you're here today. We also have some former MAG folks who are here today. We sent the word out by uh, every means that you can communicate. I mean, and, and you know, the fastest way is telecommunication. That's certainly fast. It used to be the telegraph. Uh, and then it was the telephone and then telecommunication, but the fastest we know is telebaptist. And we, we try to spread the word to let people know that Pastor Doug Metzger was going to be with us today. For 10 years, from 1987 to 1997, Pastor Doug Metzger was the pastor of this church. And uh, if, you're, if you're ready for me to move on, you have to blame him because he's the one that invited me to preach and to be the interim here. And so it's his fault that I'm still hanging around here. But we are so grateful. When I found out, we tried to get Pastor Doug in, June, uh, in May around our anniversary time. It didn't work out. Uh, he was taking treatments during that time. But when I found out he was coming uh, to California to see his uh, family, we are grateful that we were able to work out him being with us this morning. Uh, he has been a blessing to this church for many, many years and left us to go work in our denomination at the North American Mission Board. And so uh, for most of you, for many of you, he needs no introduction, even though I just gave him one. And we're grateful. Would you welcome Pastor Doug Metzger? Thank you, Pastor Monty. Thank you for the privilege of being able to be here today and the opportunity to share God's Word. A year ago, um, I lost my balance, so this has become a dear friend to me. Last thing I want to do is fall and break something. Last thing I want to do. But I'm glad to be here. How y'all doing? I'm from Atlanta, so y'all is very popular back there. Did you ever learn the plural of y'all? It's all y'all. <laughs> so all y'all, I hope you're doing great today. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to uh, the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number four, last chapter in that book. And I want to read from few of the verses there, beginning in verse uh, 6 through verse 8, and I pray God will use this today. In honor of the reading of the word, would you stand with me, please? Paul the Apostle, writing to a young man who he had become mentored to, writes and says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. Right there where you're standing, would you bow your head? I'm going to ask you to do something today. I'm going to ask you right there in the quietness of your heart, would you pray the following to God in heaven? Just say today, Lord, speak to my heart. That's all you have to do. Lord, speak to my heart. And then be open to hear what he has to say and hopefully respond to it. Father, I add to the prayer of these gathered people today, my prayer, that you would speak through your word 
by way of your servant today, and that it would penetrate many, many hearts in a powerful way. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your truth, all that you are and all that you do for us. So, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit now, strengthen me with the strength I need, with the clarity to communicate your truth and be glorified. Our prayer is in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Be seated. <clears throat> My last time in California was back in February. While I was here, one of my dearest friends of 37 years passed away and went to be with the Lord. The man had been the chairman of the pulpit committee that called me to pastor this church. His name was Jack Hawkins. His wife, Gay, did not do the service immediately while we were here. She put it off for a month and invited me to come back to be a part with Monty of the service. But because I had to go to uh, the uh, cancer center, MD Anderson in Houston that week, the schedule just didn't work out. So I asked Monty and I asked Gay if it would be all right if I did a video and sent it so that it could be incorporated in the service. And thankfully, they said yes. I want to tell you, folks, that was one of the most uplifting, powerful memorial services you would ever hope to attend for two special reasons. Number one, if you've ever been to a service where Jesus was exalted, you'd have been really at home in that service. I mean, he was lifted up and praised and honored in a powerful, powerful way. My best pastor friend from Beaumont called me up several days later. He had been here, and he said, man, if there was a hero in that service, it was Jesus. Folks, that's the way it ought to be, not only in a memorial service, but in every gathering of God's people. Second thing that made the service so memorable was the remembrances of Jack Hawkins by those who spoke. His widow, Gay, got up and, I'm telling you, as eloquently as I've ever heard a widow speak in a service, she lifted up the beauty of her husband and what a tremendous man he was. His grandkids got up and did the same. Pastor Monty and I sought to lift up the memory of Jack in a special way. And if there was one word that came out of that service that stuck with me and perhaps many others was the word legacy, that Jack Hawkins left a powerful legacy. I hope today that that's one of the things you're wanting to do. And we'll be talking about what that means today as we make our way through the service. Let me help you define what a legacy is. I've defined it these, in these words. A legacy is the long-lasting impact and influence of events and actions on people. And in relation to a person, it relates to their impact and influence on others, and it can be either positive or negative. Folks, every person here today will leave a legacy of some kind behind. The question is, will it be a positive legacy or will it be a negative legacy? That's going to be up to you to determine by the fact of what you commit your life to being like, especially as a believer. Now, let me have you think with me for a moment. When you look at all the Bible characters in the Bible, who would you say left perhaps the best legacy? Somebody might say, well, man, 
Abraham, Father Abraham, the father of Israel, the one who came from a pagan background to become such a dynamic force for God. He did leave a great legacy. Somebody else might say, well, what about Moses, the lawgiver, the one who started out delivering the people of Israel from the bondage of Egypt? What a legacy, and he leads them all the way after 40 years of wilderness wanderings to the brink of entering the promised land. What a legacy. But thirdly, somebody might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about David? I mean, what a king was David, and there's been no one ever from an earthly standpoint who was a king like David. And he gave us so many remembrances of him by way of uh, the book of Psalms, a good portion of them written by King David. But if I were to say to you today that I'm not sure that I would put him up there with one other person in the Bible, that person would be the Apostle Paul. If you remember, he did not start out as an apostle. <laughs> He started out as Saul of Tarsus. Do you remember that? A persecutor of the church. Someone who was there at the death of the first Christian martyr, Stephen, who made it his business, his priority in life, to go out and wipe out Christianity if he could. But thankfully, on the road to Damascus one day, on his way to persecute Christians. Do you remember what happened? He met the Lord Jesus. And right there on the road to Damascus, he said, Lord, what would you have me do? I'm yours. I'm yours. He committed his life to Jesus. I hope you've done that. It may not have been a Damascus Road experience for you, but I pray that somewhere along the way, you've come to the decision that you need him. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. If you've not made that decision, today would be even a great day to do that on this Labor Day weekend, 2023. But the Apostle Paul did that. And oh, did God radically not only change his life, but use his life in the most powerful, powerful, powerful of ways. And he did that amidst so many difficulties. If you recall, Paul was beaten for his faith in Christ. He was imprisoned for his faith in Christ. He suffered many other indignities for his faith in Christ. He was shipwrecked. I mean, the list goes on of what happened to the Apostle Paul because of his faith in Christ. And yet all the way through it, he remained committed to what was required of him. And what a legacy Paul's life leads by way of an example for you and for me. If you could capture Paul's legacy in three terms, I believe what he said in verse 7 of 2 Corinthians, or 2 Timothy chapter 4, captures it very well. He said of himself, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And better yet, I have kept the faith. I want us to unpack that this morning. But before I do, let's consider the context in which that was spoken. It was spoken by Paul to Timothy to kind of help Timothy realize that, Timothy, you've got to stay in the game. It'll be sometimes like paddling upstream. It'll be difficult. But give yourself wholeheartedly to everything that's required to be a minister of the gospel. You find that in the few, first few verses of chapter 4. But then in verse 6, Paul turns personal. 
and he says of himself, I see my life as being ready to be poured out as an offering, like the drink offering in the sacrificial system. It's going to be poured out. It's going to be taken from me. And then he says, my departure is at hand. He saw himself as being right on the brink of setting sail. You see, the word departure there is a word that means for a ship to pull in the lines that's been docked there at the pier and set sail. Paul saw his life as having been one of being tied to this world, but now, oh boy, the, the lines are loosening and he's going to depart. He's going to set sail from here to that glorious place that God has prepared for his children. And he was looking forward to it. Hey, we ought to be looking forward to it. We're so tied to this world here sometimes, we don't give it what we ought to. And then he begins to say the legacy of his life. He says, number one, I have fought the good fight. I don't know if you realize it or not, but so many times in this book, the Christian life for a believer is referred to as the life of a Christian warrior. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, man, you come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved and life will be so great after that. Can I give you a good, good word for that? It's found in the Greek. It's the word baloney. <laughs> baloney. Folks, that's a lie. The Christian life is a life that's a battle because you are facing the enemies of hell. An enemy set on defeating you, discouraging you, depressing you, and the list goes on. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. That's not our main enemy. Our main enemy, the Bible says, is the demonic forces of hell. And they're coming at you, and they're coming at me. We're in a battle. Paul writes in the second letter to Timothy, the challenge that, Timothy, you need to keep on when the going gets tough. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 3, he says, you need to endure hardship as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Folks, you hang in there, no matter what the cost may be. The reality is for a military man, Sometimes the cost is far greater than they ever thought they'd have to pay when the ultimate price is given. And that may happen in the life of others. Back in June, I finished the book by a classmate of mine from the Naval Academy named Ed Lentz. Ed wrote the book, A Filthy Way to Die, by telling the background for the involvement of America in the Vietnam War. And he gave a great chronological story of it all. And then he enlists, of all things, 61 of our classmates from the class of 1965 at the Naval Academy to offer testimony of what they went through. Some of them were Marine Corps pilots. Some of them were Marine Corps infantry and artillery. Others of them were Navy pilots or Navy surface warfare officers. Some of them served on swift boats. Numbers of ways in which they found themselves involved in the Vietnam War. These were guys that were on their first or second tour of duty fresh out of four years at the Naval Academy. And what many of them saw was horrible. People being blown up by mines, being blown up by artillery. Nine, nine of our classmates, guys who had finished these four 
grueling years at the academy, they lost their lives. They, along with 58,000 other Americans, lost their lives. Anybody here served in the Vietnam War? Yes. I'll tell you, it was an awful experience. And what happened there should never have happened had the leaders in Washington that tried to run the war had a strategy that should have been followed to, to win that war, but they never did. And as a result, a lot of lives were lost that should never have been lost. I personally encountered some of the horrors of that war when my ship on our second tour in Vietnam waters went up to what they called Northern Star Station in the Gulf of Tonkin. And there we sat 12 miles off the coast of North Vietnam, sitting ducks in many ways. But our job was to pick up pilots that coming out of North Vietnam recognized they'd been shot up too bad to make it back to the aircraft carrier, so they ditched. They ejected, opened their parachute, and landed in the water. Some of them were so badly shot up themselves that when our helicopter went to pick them up, they were dead right there in the water. Brought back to our ship, placed in body bags. I'll tell you, that'll sober you up. And then some other pilots went down and they drowned in their parachute. Our helicopter on board one day went out and tried to effect a rescue over land of a pilot that they heard the beeper letting them know where he was. And they went in, couldn't get to him. And they themselves were shot up. They came back, all four of the, the members of that, that uh, helicopter, a pilot, co-pilot, and two crewmen. And all of them had been shot. All of them would get Purple Hearts. One of them, they would put out a request for blood. And as we lined up to give blood based on our blood type, we got the word, he's passed away. Again, that'll sober you to the realization that war can be costly. It can be a filthy way to die. Why do I tell you that story? Well. On the screen, they're going to put up the reason that I've given. That story is an endeavor. Guys, can you get that up there? It's an endeavor to help you to see that being a good military man requires being willing to pay the price, any price, even the ultimate price to fight the good fight. That's why I tell you that story. You and I ought to relate to that. But we especially ought to relate to it as believers in Christ. The book's story should be seen in relationship to what a Christian soldier is to be willing to give. And that's to pay the price in serving. And that includes any price. You see, Paul was so willing to give whatever it took. He would die at the hands of a Roman sword, execution style. Horrible. So here's a good question for you this morning. Will it ever cost you your life to serve Christ? The probability of that, I believe, is very slim. Could happen, but most unlikely, it's not going to happen. But maybe even more importantly, the question would be, what if it were to happen? Are you committed enough to Jesus Christ that whatever the cost, you would be willing to pay that? Folks, that ought to be the case for every believer here today. Some of you aren't there yet. Hopefully, you're praying and trying to develop a life that gets you there. The Apostle Paul would have said, I'm not only willing, 
I'm ready to do it. May that be our testimony. It's part of the legacy that Paul would leave. Secondly, I want you to know this. Not only did he fight the good fight, but he finished the course by running well the race that was set before him. The Apostle Paul turns from the analogy of a soldier in battle to the analogy of a runner running a race. I don't know about you, but I've always enjoyed running. I hate that having to use this and not having <laughs> what I used to have by way of ability, I don't run anymore. Hey, I can hardly walk, I don't run. But the reality is I love to run. One of my big regrets in life is that I never got to run a marathon. Any of you ever run a marathon? Hey, yeah, good for you. <laughs> I would love to have run a marathon. You see, running to me can be exhilarating, but in honesty, it also can be grueling, it can be tough. Marathon runners, I don't know if you can testify to this, hit what they call the wall. Did you, ever, did you hit the wall? It's that place in a marathon where heading towards those 26 miles to the end of the race, they come to that place where it's so grueling that they're not sure they can take one more step towards the finish line. And at that point, there's the temptation. Throw in the towel. Quit. Why are you punishing yourself like this? Thankfully, I don't know of many that did it. The Apostle Paul surely hit the wall from time to time in running the race that he ran. And that yet, tempted as he may have been to throw in the towel and quit, he never did, thank God. He kept on keeping on in spite of the obstacles, in spite of the punishment he would have to endure. Paul was committed to making it to the end. No matter what may befall him on the way and what other runners running the race did. Paul, no doubt, saw many a believer quit. In fact, he mentioned some of them in some of his letters. But Paul said, that's not going to be my, my testimony, my legacy. I'm going to make it to the end. Folks, a runner who's a winner will do that. He will finish the course, and he'll do it on the right course. Let me share a story with you that happened way back in 1993, right here in Riverside, California. The NCAA II division held its national cross-country race at beautiful Victoria Country Club, right off of Victoria Avenue and not far from uh, Arlington Avenue. I played that course a, a number of times with Dr. Mel Call when I was pastor here, beautiful place. For those of you who don't know about cross-country running, it's not run on an oval track like other races are run. It's run kind of like the story that we sing about at Christmas time. Over the river and through the woods, you know that song? To grandmother's house we go. Well, that's a cross country race. It's over the river, through the woods, whatever the course may lay out. A young man by the name of Mike Del Cavo came from a school in Colorado to run in the race. He was one of 138 other runners. Mike Del Cavo had the goal, knowing he was not good enough probably to finish number one or in the top 10, of at least finishing in the top 25. Why? If you finish in the top 25, you could be declared an All-American. Mike wanted to do that, so 
he decided to come early and walk the course so he would know the turns and what to do. So the day of the race came, the runners began to run, and Mike's not running at the beginning or the front of the pack, but he's not too far back. When all of a sudden, the runners go up over a hill and down towards the only lake on uh, Victoria Country Club. And they come to that lake having to make a decision. The lead runner would look out and say, well, if I could walk on water, maybe I ought to run through the, water, the, the lake. But he couldn't do that. So he has an option. Do I go to the left? Do I go to the right? He made the decision to go to the left. And because of peer pressure, runner after runner after runner following him went to the left. Mike came up and he'd been yelling, no, 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 you're going the wrong way. Couldn't get anybody's attention. So when he came to the lake, he had to make a decision. Do I go to the left with the pack with everybody else, or do I go to the right knowing that's the course I'm supposed to be running on? Well, Mike made the decision, I'm going to run the right course in spite of what the other runners did. I never knew that story until Lou Giglio, some of you know the name, came having spoken at Cal Baptist, came over and spoke that Sunday here, and he told that story. Interesting story. Mike's running along now, having become the lead runner on the right course, and four other runners, that's all, four others, followed him. Well, thinking he's leading the pack, he's saying, man, I'm going to finish first. And he did finish first on the right course, the problem is, the other runners, having gone to the left, ran a shorter course, and all 133 of them finished ahead of him. So who won the race? The guy who ran the wrong course or the one that ran the right one? The officials got their heads together, and they made the decision, the awful decision. We're going to declare the guy running the wrong course the winner. Why? Because we can't have a race of 138 runners and only five finish. Well, duh, you could, but they didn't. So at that point, Mike Del Cavo had to make a decision. Do I raise a stink of how wrong this is? Or do I just accept the fact that I just, for the sake of my sport, need to go with a decision. <clears throat> I don't know what you put in there, Monty, but thank you. <laughs> if it's what he puts in his drinks, you'll understand why. <laughs> <clears throat> but in Mike's heart of hearts, though he didn't win, so he didn't become All-American. He knew that he had done the right thing. But the story doesn't end there. It doesn't. In 1993, in the final article in Sports Illustrated magazine, they picked up on 93 stories of things that went wrong that year in the sports world. And one of the stories they included was Mike Del Cabo's story. In fact, they entitled the article for him, Right Way Mike. They put his picture there. And the interesting thing is, <laughs> the guy that won the race never got mentioned, never even had his picture in the article. He ran the right course the right way. If there had been a magazine in the Apostle Paul's day, and they were writing about things that went wrong. I think many of them would have said, man, that guy's life went wrong. Think of all the potential he had. But he didn't want to succeed by the world's standards. He went his own way. 
Truth is, he went God's way. Paul was not interested in finishing life a success by the world's standards. And that's why he made the decision that no matter what anybody else does, I'm going with God. I'm going to pay the price to run the race on the right course to the finish line. Paul knew what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 when Jesus said, there is a broad way and many there be that go down the broad way. The sad thing is it leads to destruction, but there is a narrow way and few there be that find it. But boy, when they go down the narrow way, they find what life was really meant to be. And folks, hopefully that's the decision you've made today. It's so easy to follow the crowd down the wrong pathway. And so many people in our day, because of peer pressure, are doing that. And some of you may find yourself having become a victim of that, compromised at places you should never compromise. How are you running the race? That's a good question for you today. And are you running it on the right course? Paul said, I have run the race, I have finished the course, and it's part of my legacy. It ought to be part of yours. Third thing Paul mentions, and I will close with this, is that he had kept the faith. He had kept the faith. How do you define that? Well, there's two ways in which the word faith is used in the Bible. The first one we're very familiar with by way of the fact that it is what we exercise. Let me read for you what's on the screen. It's keeping the faith, meaning never wavering in your trust in Christ. It has to do with keeping on believing through the ups and downs of life. The Apostle Paul maintained a strong trust in God in spite of the beatings, the imprisonments, the indignities that were done to him. He didn't let that keep him from keeping his faith and his eyes on Jesus. Folks, you're going to have hardships in life. You've got to keep your eyes on him. The second use of the word faith that we find in the Bible refers to holding on to the body of faith contained in the Word of God. The word kept literally means to guard it, to watch over it. And that's what Paul did with the body of faith. He never, as I said a moment ago, com compromised on the truth of God in spite of the pain and suffering that he had to endure. And I believe it's the second use of the word faith that Paul is referring to when he says, I have kept the faith. So here's a good question for you this morning. What would it mean for us to keep the faith? What would it mean? You ought to consider that this morning because you ought to want that to be part of your legacy. What would it mean? Well, to me, at a minimum, here's what it would mean. It would require maintaining a total commitment to living by the book of books, the Bible. That means putting a priority on the Word of God in your life. Sadly, some of you come to church maybe every Sunday, I hope so. You get a couple hours of ministry here in the worship center and maybe in the Sunday school Bible study class you go to. And that's it. You never pick it up. You never open it up. You never let it speak to you. Folks, the Word of God, Paul said it also in Timothy, chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show yourself approved unto men, unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed. 
rightly dividing the word of truth. Explain that, Doug. Well, let me offer you a paraphrase. Paraphrase found in the Living Bible of that verse. Here's what it says. Work hard. Why? So God can say to you, well done. Be a good workman, one who does not need to be ashamed when God examines your work. Know what it says and know what it means. Now, folks, to do that, you know what it requires? Discipline. It requires you being willing to say, I don't know what I ought to do, but I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Maybe for some of you, call yourself a Christian, never pick up the book. You need to say, well, you know what? I've missed it. And you start maybe a couple verses a day, maybe a chapter a day, maybe, as I try to do quite often, five psalms a day and a, a, a proverb. It's a good discipline for my life. The reality is it's important for you to get into the book. Get a devotional. Our daily bread, I read it every day. I have been for nearly 50 years. Great devotional. Inspires me. Brings me to the realization of some things that I need to be realizing. Folks, think about it in this vein. If a Romeo courting a Juliet has to go on a trip and Juliet sends him a love letter, a love letter that comes in the mail, and he opens it up. Think with me this morning. Does he just casually read it and throw it aside? <laughs> I don't think so. He takes that love letter, and he reads it, and he reads it again, and he puts it somewhere where tomorrow he reads it again, and he reads it again. Folks, that's what people who fall in love do. Well, what, what is this book? It's a love letter. It's a love letter from God to every believer. Why? So that you and I can know how he feels about us and what he's looking from us to do. Man, discipline yourself to give that. Well, in a nutshell, that's what it means to keep the faith, to keep the faith. You know, having viewed Jack Hawkins' service online and being impressed by the legacy that was spoken of in that service back in March, hopefully all of us who were here or watched online began to think about what legacy am I leaving behind? What will people be able to say of me when I leave this life. Folks, I've got to be honest with you, in light of Jack's legacy and Paul's legacy, I've had to give much thought to my legacy. What impact, what influence in regard to what I've done will I leave behind for my kids, my grandkids, the people I've had an opportunity to engage with in this life? Will my kids and grandkids remember that I didn't start out in a Christian home? I started out in the home of a bartender and a, Christian, or a, a cocktail waitress. That's my testimony. They lived a life of eat, drink, and be merry, wonderful parents, but not living according to the Word of God. And as a result of that, I followed their pathway. And man, I lived some bad years. But at the age of 28, six years into my Navy career, I had an encounter. My Damascus Road happened when a young enlisted man opened up the Word of God and shared with me the plan of salvation. And that night in February 1971, I gave my life to Christ. And oh, glory be to God, what a difference he's made in my life. 
And then within two months, because of what she saw in my life, my wife Leslie began to say, man, I don't know what he's got, but it looks pretty good. And she ultimately gave her life to Christ. Six months almost to the day after God saved me, I knew he had called me to the gospel ministry. I gave my commanding officer resignation from the Navy, and a year later, I found myself down at Southwestern Seminary, same seminary that Pastor Monty graduated from. And three years later, went back to my hometown of all places to pastor my first church. And I got to baptize the bartender and his, Christ, his wife, my mom and dad. Woo. Glory be to God. And since that time, I pastored five churches over nearly 50 years, and I've spent 11 years in denominational work for Southern Baptist at the Home Mission Board and the North American Mission Board. And during the course of those years, part of my legacy is I've been married to the same woman for over 50 years. Married in love and faithful. Over 50 years, how wonderful. And then it's had its struggles. You would know how difficult it was if you knew my wife. <laughs> oh, and what she's had to put up with me, I forgot to say that. <laughs> but folks, I'm so glad we have that legacy to leave to our kids. Thankfully, all three of my kids are married to the same person that they married. One of them right here in this building back in 19, whatever, 2001, I think it was. And man, it's been such a privilege to live the life God's given me to live. Three wonderful children, eight beautiful grandchildren. And yet, honestly, I look back and so much I wish I could have done differently than I did. As a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a friend, so many ways. And yet I confronted along the way my difficulties. I did. I mean, you can't serve in a church and not have difficulties with your deacons. <laughs> they ought to be your best friends. Thankfully, that's what it was here, and hopefully, Monty, you have found that out as well. But I want to tell you, I've had some churches where the deacons thought it was your, their job to make me miserable. And some of them did. <laughs> some of them did. And then I think about the fact that as wonderful as my children were, they brought some headaches into our life. If you knew my son, Doug Jr., <clears throat> poor Doug became an addict to alcohol, to, to uh, drugs, and what a spiral down his life took. And boy, what heartache he brought to me and to Leslie and to his wife, Carolyn. But I'm happy to say today, <laughs> to the glory of God, what a change has happened in that boy's life. And today, through a prison ministry called The Saints, he's serving the Lord. And a couple weeks ago on a Thursday night, I heard him get up at a banquet for over 600 people and give a testimony that moved their hearts because of the grace of God he's experienced in his life. Woo. To God be the glory. And then I'll add one other thing to my testimony, not for you to feel sorry for me, but just the fact that through the grace and faithfulness of God, I've made it through 23 years of being in a battle with the same cancer. And yet here I am. I finished an interim back in January, 21 months, about wore me out. But God saw me through. Folks, he's faithful. And by his grace, I don't know what you're going to be going through, but my word to you today is stay by the stuff. Realize the importance of your legacy. 
what you will leave behind for people to remember of you. Give it what it requires. Not just for their sake, but ultimately our legacy ought to be for the glory and honor of the one who paid the price for us to have what we have in our salvation. So, in closing, what legacy will you leave behind? If you don't know Jesus, then it'll be a nothing. It won't be anything. Give your life to Christ even today. As a believer, as the praise team comes forward, some of you need to repent of some things going on in your life. You're not on the right course. You're not running the race, fighting the fight, keeping the faith. It's time to change that. And you need to do that today. Bow with me as we pray and then we'll sing. Pastor Monty and some of the counselors will be here at the front should you want to come and share a prayer request or make a decision today. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your love for us. A love that the songwriter said will not let us go. And I thank you for that. In spite of our failings from time to time. God, I pray today that you have spoken into the heart of every person here the importance of living their life, fighting the good fight, running the race, and keeping the faith. Be honored now by whatever decisions may be made, and to God be the glory in Jesus' name. Thanks for listening to today's message. You can connect more with Magnolia Church on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or at magonline.com. If you're interested in partnering with us financially to help us continue spreading this message of good news, you can do so at magonline.com give.